Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I think quite a few are still joining, so let me maybe wait a few more seconds while some of you connect to your audio. Um, my name is uh, Elisa van Weinberg and I am the co-head of the uh, economics department. It's a job that I share with my colleague uh, Hannah Bargawi. Welcome to uh, this brief talk about uh, the SOAS economics department. I'm joined here by my colleague Tobias Franz, who is convener of the MSc Political Economy uh, of Development, as well as by Adam George, who is currently a student with us he was a student with us last year on one of our uh, postgraduate uh, taught programs, and then he transitioned into the PhD program. So he can he can speak to his journey from the MSc economics to the PhD uh, economics. So um, the way I want us to proceed uh, is first, I want to say a few things about what we see as distinctive about uh, the economics department uh, at SOAS. Um, and then I will hand over to Tobias, who will talk about what that means for you in terms of the kind of uh, degree programs we offer, the approach we take uh, in our curriculum, uh, etc. Uh, then Adam will say something in terms of what that means from the student perspective. So how do these things that how we understand our department translate uh, in the student experience? And then uh, before closing, I'll say something about uh, where do your studies at SOAS uh, take you? Because obviously we are very well aware that as you choose to do your master's somewhere, you will have a keen eye on what, what opportunities that's gonna create for you as you leave uh, the institution. Now, this is um, very informal. Um, you are um, welcome to uh, unmute yourself and speak at any point in time or interrupt me if you have particular questions, but we will also have a dedicated space for a Q&A at the end. However, before um, I start the kind of more formal review of what the economics department at SOAS is, I was wondering whether um, you wanted to share your ideas in terms of what you think the most important challenges are for economics in the next few years or in the next decade. So I'm just, this is just um, to get a sense from our prospective students, you in, uh, how you understand what the big challenges are for uh, the discipline uh, in, the, in the next decade. Um, so if you want to either unmute yourself and, and speak out, or make some suggestions in the in the in the chat in terms of how you understand that that would be uh, wonderful um tobias just to you i can't see the chat because i'm sharing so if you pick up what what um, happens there that would be wonderful yes i'll do that so so give us uh, uh, your thoughts in terms of what you think are the most important challenges for economics um in today and going forward, if you want, for the next decade. Oh, hello, ma'am. I'm Jashwin. I'm joining from India. Hello. So, I am interested in developmental economics. So, uh, so about coming to your question, uh, for me, in my humble opinion, the biggest challenge uh, currently is to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, the, the shocks due to the pandemic. And after that, progressively, it is more uh, uh, has to do with inequality, the rising inequality and the gig economy and how uh, the inequality is causing an inequality. Inequality in income is causing an inequality in education, how that uh, is going to reflect in future a gig economy jobs and incomes of people. So I think that will be some of major challenges. Thank you very much. That's uh, wonderful. Um, any other suggestions on major challenges? And, and please either speak up or feel free to feed them into the chat. Hello, my name is Jerry. Hello, Jerry. Yeah, uh, for me, the biggest challenge that we currently face is the multiplication of poverty across the world as an aftermath effect of the COVID-19. Like the first speaker said, the recovery part does not seem to be clear yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Anyone else wants to add to that in terms of very important challenges that we face today and that we are likely to have to deal with over the next 10 years? Any other thoughts? Anything in the chat, Tobias? No, nothing in the chat, um, but do feel free to say whatever you think. There's no wrong answer. So um, we just would like to hear from you also what you're interested in um, and, and learning from uh, potentially doing a degree at SOAS um, about a particular challenge that you see um, in the world, maybe in the country that you live in. Um, so please don't be shy. As, as I mean, I think we the, the main issue that's been raised already is the issues, uh, the, the big theme around inequalities. Uh, I hear in a, rising inequalities. I hear labor markets in terms of gig economy. I hear multiplication of poverty, the aftermath of COVID-19. What's the recovery path going to um, be uh, after uh, as we and hopefully when we uh, emerge from the uh, pandemic? When I asked some of your uh, colleagues who, who managed, I mean, who joined us on campus last week for an on-campus event, I, we, I heard similar themes in terms of uh, the most important challenges for the economy. To that, they added perhaps issues around the role of China in the world economy. Some of your uh, colleagues spoke about um, the environment as a massive challenge uh, that we are facing. Um, challenges around how what is going to happen with globalization, what are the newly emerging patterns around trade and production and financial flows, uh, etc. So I think if we think about the most important challenges across, um, you know, that we are going to face in uh, the discipline, it's nice, I think, to think about that in conjunction with uh, the members of staff uh, in the department and the particular kind of issues that they are um, engaged with uh, in their uh, research. So if uh, I've heard one of you saying rising inequalities, we have quite a bit of work that's happening within the department, in particular with an interest on intersecting inequalities. So the way in which inequalities intersect across different structural features of the economy, including gender, including uh, class. And so we have, for instance, uh, Dr. Hannah Bargawi, Sarah Stevano, Surbi Kesar, very strongly interested in issues around intersecting inequalities. We have specific work that's going on on uh, informalities in the labor market. So one of you referred to the gig economy. So we have Satoshi Miyamura and again, Surbi Kesar, who are very focused on that. When we think about post-pandemic recovery paths, we have quite a few uh, economists that are either macroeconomists or structuralist economists that are thinking about that in the, in the context of a specific region. For instance, Tobias, who is here with us today, is very interested in understanding these post-recovery, these post-pandemic recovery paths that are possibly emerging in the developing world. And he has a focus on uh, Latin America. We have the macroeconomists like Yanis Dafemos, um, Jan Toprovsky, Kostas Lepavitsas, who think about that, but in uh, some of them in light of the climate emergency that we are facing. And then if we bring it back to one of the big other very live themes of the day, there is also issues around China, the role of China in the world economy. And there we have Diklo as well as uh, Ulrich Poltz who make contributions around that. So I think that across our uh, department, we have uh, a collection of uh, colleagues who are interested in those very live issues uh, of today, whether we're talking about inequalities, whether we're talking about recovery paths from the pandemic, whether we're talking about the reconstitution of uh, economic relations globally with the rise of China, uh, et cetera. And these particular um, interests have been validated in the sense that we have a very strong track record with uh, funded um, real world economic research. So we have one of our colleagues, Mushtaq Khan, who has been very heavily engaged in work around uh, corruption and who has uh, been very successful in securing um, grants from uh, what is now called the FCDO, formerly uh, DFID, to study um, ways, strategies of mitigating uh, corruption practices 
in specific countries. So his big research project that is that goes by the acronym ACE for anti-corruption evidence looks at the way in which uh, corruption in specific sectors, like for instance health, health procurement or uh, power procurement, as in energy procurement, can be mitigated across different countries and the countries that he's studying are Bangladesh, Tanzania and Nigeria. He's also been able to secure um, uh, funding for a highly innovative research project that works very closely with the policymakers from within the FCDO as they are trying to test the assumptions that underpin the interventions of the FCDO in Nepal as it's seeking to support Nepal uh, for a, a, a just transition uh, in a post-war or a post-conflict, if you want, setting. We have also quite a few research projects in the climate uh, uh, space that are focusing around macroeconomic issues, mainly looking at the monetary policy sphere of macroeconomic issues, what should central banks do or not do, yeah, as they are trying to support uh, transitions in, um, in, the, in the economy towards uh, um, uh, better climate aligned alignment uh, in the way in which the economy is organized. And we have had uh, research focused on female employment and, and the particular issues around inequalities, comparing outcomes across uh, the regions of the Middle East, North Africa and South Asia. So this is just a sample of the kind of um, funded research that is going on in the department. And that goes to demonstrate once more the way in which colleagues in the department have a strong interest in those issues that are very live uh, today. Uh, so I think it's quite apt for us to think of the SOAS Economics Department as a unique department. We think of us as being world leading in uh, the fact that we have very strong uh, development economics traditions lodged within uh, the department. There is very strong interest in various issues of economic policy, whether we're talking about uh, interventions in labor markets, whether we're talking about interventions in the macroeconomy, whether we're talking about interventions in the financial sector. Our colleagues are continuously engaged in trying to think about how their research can impact specific uh, policies in those spheres. And we also consider ourselves to be a world leading department in political economy with a strong acknowledgement across the various traditions that we work from within uh, of the importance of a power and institutions in determining um, particular economic outcomes. So we are actually the foremost pluralist economics department in the UK and perhaps uh, in the world as we bring together a collection of feminist economists, uh, development economists, ecological economists, post-Keynesian economists, institutional economists, and Marxist political economists. So I think we're very unique in the combination of those various scholarly traditions from within economics that we bring together within our department. We're also one of the very few departments of economics that has a staff establishment with near gender parity. This is very, very unusual for an economics department to have so many female um, members of staff. Of course, we have very strong links to international institutions that are very engaged in the policy sphere, whether we're talking about different UN agencies, whether we're talking about uh, different central banks. Um, we have very strong links also to other uh, leading uh, universities. Now, over the last few years, and in light of um, what is going on uh, in the world, we have also sought to bring environmental topics at the core of, of the teaching and the research that we do in recognition of the climate uh, emergency. And we are very strongly engaged more broadly in debates, in policy debates uh, around global development. Again, whether we're talking uh, in the global policy sphere and how that gets constituted as through the interventions of the World Bank or the IMF or interventions of specific UN agencies, whether it's the one focused on Africa, whether it's the one focused on, on trade or the one focused on labor markets. Uh, and that is again, across the piece, um, both in the global North and the global uh, South. When we think then in terms of our teaching, we like to think about our teaching in terms of four words that start with ours. We think we like to think about what we offer through our postgraduate curriculum as speaking to the main issues that are facing us today in the real world, some of which I have already mentioned or you have already mentioned. So the issues around inequalities, recoveries, 
um, the environment, etc. We also like to think about our teaching uh, as rigorous in the sense that we would like to teach our students what's at the cutting edge of the discipline, even if then we offer them a com an, an, an alternative approach where they can then do a compare and contrast across different scholarly traditions within economics, both what we call mainstream, i.e. what is taught in most universities, and then what we uh, offer from within alternatives, from within heterodox uh, economics. We also, we have also um, reformed and uh, updated our quants teaching, where we are now trying to teach our students skills that they can put to work as they leave us uh, immediately, where they to join, for instance, a research department, etc. Our teaching is uh, regional, it draws on the very strong regional expertise that we have lodged across our colleagues, across the regions that SOAS is focused on. So we're talking Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, but we have recently also acquired um, um, expertise in Latin America and that allows us for quite, again, unique comparative perspectives across different regions, broadening now to incorporate Latin America. And our teaching, especially at our postgraduate level, is very strongly research-led. So the colleagues that teach you will uh, draw continuously as appropriate on the research that they are doing or on the research that is happening uh, from uh, by other colleagues uh, in the department. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Tobias, who is going to talk a little bit more about what this means specifically for you. Yeah, thank you very much, Elisa, and um, also welcome for me. Um, so what Elisa was saying, one of the main appeals of the economics department at SOAS, and I think also known for worldwide, is that we don't uh, sort of buy into neither the theoretical nor the empirical narrative that you might see in more mainstream institutions or mainstream um, departments, but rather question sort of these um, theoretical approaches that are also broadly known as, as orthodox economic theories that um, propose general equilibrium models that essentially are um, focusing on that the market kind of works uh, perfectly once left to themselves. So what we are doing in our research and, and also in the teaching that um, especially at postgraduate level um, is to not only learn these orthodox theories, but then learn them from a point of view where they have weaknesses and where, the, where there are gaps in this kind of literature that does not explain what Lisa referred to in, as, as real world economic phenomena, um, such as rising inequalities, um, labor market um, um, uh, changes and, and, and increasing informality and so on that you guys brought up. Um, and then we critique that not just by pointing these pointing towards these gaps, these gaps that exist, but then also um, bridging these gaps with alternative theoretical and empirical approaches, which um, is also known as heterodox economics or pluralist economics. And this is where a lot of the teaching is focused for you to learn the orthodoxy, but then also very much engage with heterodox and alternative approaches to critique the, the, the mainstream and to actually question the way in which economies are working um, right now. Um, this uh, is also, of course, paired with uh, very rigorous um, uh, empir um, not empirical, but methodological uh, training, both in quantitative techniques, such as econometrics and interpretation and presentation of um, quantitative results, as well as qualitative techniques. So all of the master's programs, and I get to that in a little bit, have um, methodological courses that um, you will have to uh, go through and, and, and then learn how to use quantitative as well as qualitative techniques. Part of it is also uh, learning how to write codes in R for data analysis, for economic modeling, if you're interested in that. And, um, there are different programs where you, um, where you engage more with these kind of more uh, mathematical and statistical techniques. And there's other programs such as the MSc Political Economy of Development or the MA Economic Policy, where it's more focused on, uh, on, 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 on not, not so much on regression analysis, but other um, methodological um, approaches, but um, we can get to that in the Q&A. Um, 
yeah, uh, not we, we don't only like to, we don't only do in, in our teaching, we, we don't only provide um, empirical and theoretical and methodological training, but also we apply that to economic policy analysis, to an economic policy making. So not just critiquing uh, the way in which economies are organized, but then also really proposing alternatives from our critiques uh, in, in ways in which uh, could improve economic policy making and then tackle these issues that you guys raised um, in, um, in, in, in the beginning of this session. Um, yes, as, as said before, we, we are world leading in heterodox economics um, and also what Lisa pointed out, we are very much regional focused, but this doesn't mean that we look at these region in isolation, but rather we have a very global approach. So we look at the way in which uh, globalization, the integration of different regions into uh, global value chains um, affect uh, development outcomes affect inequalities and affect poverty in these regions. So we do take a, a, an approach that looks at it from a more global perspective and then apply it to these different regions. Um, we have different programs. There's the MSc Economics, Development Economics, uh, the MSc in Political Economy and Development, International Finance and Development, uh, the MSc in Economics and Environment, and the MA in economic policy. So as I said before, different programs focus on different uh, issues. Uh, each program has different sets of core uh, foundational modules and theory methods and advanced topics, as well as a wide range of optional modules with a sectoral and regional focus. Um, as said before, the MA economic policy and the MSc political economy of development um, do not require you to have uh, uh, an in-depth uh, knowledge of economics or of quantitative economics uh, for the MA economic policy, even you don't require a first degree at all in economics. So we are also open to um, those applications that are not in, in sort of the classical training have gone through um, courses that include econometrics, macroeconomics, microeconomics, but um, uh, uh, might have only taken a module in economic policy or in economics 101 and so on. So there are ways in which you can enter the department without uh, going through, having gone through classical um, um, economics training in your undergrad. Um, and of course, with our teaching that, 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 that is provided throughout these modules, you will also be prepared to write a dissertation um, by yourself under, of course, the supervision of staff members and experts in the field. And there you can apply a lot of the things that you've learned um, to a, a, a single piece study that you can engage with, uh, you can engage in over uh, a, a few months during the summer. Um, if you find more information, of course, on our programs and do feel free as well to reach out to the program conveners of these programs. So uh, on our website, every program has listed a member of staff. So just write them an email. They'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Besides our traditional teaching, we also have a number of events that are run throughout that are running throughout the year. We have a, a SOAS economics seminar series, which during the, the COVID pandemic was a webinar series, but now we're very much um, happy to be back on campus with that, in which we organize speeches and seminars. Um, and invite people from across uh, Europe um, to join us at the, uh, um, on campus to give a talk on a new book that they published or some new research project that they are engaged in. So this is also a way in which you can uh, engage with colleagues from across different universities and different um, and different world and different countries. Sorry, we also have uh, a ran different events during the COP26 um, to uh, increase some of the focus on the environment um, where students also participated actively. Um, so. Tobias, can I just add, um, just to highlight also, so we have these extracurricular uh, events as in, for instance, our seminar series, but I think what's also nice that you can pick up from the program of the current term is that these are on a wide range of different issues. 
So you can see there is issues around what's going on in the UK with uh, the re recovery or not of Corona. Then there is a whole different uh, seminar that's about what did what China did in the 1980s and how it reformed its price system. And again, we have something very different, which is on financial inclusion and poverty, etc. So there is again that wide diversity of interests that is reflected across the various events that we um, we organize. Yes, thank you, Elisa. Um, uh, yes, and apart from these extracurricular events that you can engage with in terms of seminars, we also have a variety of student societies and groups that are led by students, such as the SOAS Feminist Economics Network, um, in which students meet um, with some members of staff to discuss a certain text or to discuss a certain issue um, outside of the curriculum. Also, the SOAS Economic Sustainability Working Groups, in which um, members of staff, as well as students, uh, engage not just in literature, uh, in, 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 in the discussion of literature, but also in the way in which we can make SOAS as an institution more sustainable, and what are the ways in which um, we can suggest to uh, the running of SOAS to be more in line with um, sustainable and sustainability goals. Uh, we have a decolonized SOAS working group, both at the school level as well as one that we are currently um, putting up in the department. So this is also something that you can engage in when you are at SOAS. And finally, uh, the SOAS Open Economics Forum that um, organizes events outside of the department. Um, this is purely student-led, um, and we, um, um, of course, support them in uh, various ways to um, to organize events and um, discussion groups. Yeah, and I think that uh, being said, uh, let me hand it over to Adam, who will give a perspective of a student, um, what that all um, sort of felt like being a student and what how that has led him to then apply to a PhD in the department. Thanks, thanks, Elias. Uh, yeah, so I'm 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 Adam, and I was a MSc student last year, so during during the COVID year, uh, as as it were. And, and I guess I should I'd probably start by talking about why why I chose SOAS or why I was looking at SOAS. And I, I, I think this very much echoes what Elisa and Tobias are saying about heterodox kind of pluralist approaches. That's something I knew I was interested in, and I saw SOAS and saw kind of the work they were doing. Uh, I, I watched some presentations from uh, from staff members at SOAS uh, and thought it was quite impressive. Again, this was during COVID, so seeing effectively how staff at SOAS were kind of approaching these issues in 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 in, in a way that I didn't really see from other other universities. And, it's, and I think it's all linked to this kind of heterodox global perspective, which I really do think uh, sets SOAS apart. And as, as a student, I think that absolutely feeds through, uh, as, as Tobias was saying, to how, how economics is taught. So it's very research led, you're very much, but particularly in some of like the second semester modules, but in the first semester as well, you're, you're talking about, um, you, you are very much having discussions about the research, kind of ongoing current research uh, that uh, lecturers uh, are, are undergoing themselves, so it's it's very interesting, and you feel like you're part of, of something quite quite special. I think um, as as a student, I I did get involved. Well, I'm, I'm still involved in quite a few of those groups that Tobias just spoke about. So uh, the Open Economics Forum, particularly, uh, I, I watched some of the uh, some of the stuff they did before uh, I, I joined SOAS, and I got involved when I joined, and I've continued to be involved this year uh, in my PhD. Uh, the Open Economics Forum, just for context, is the student-led part of uh, Rethink Economics, which is a global group that was set up after the financial crisis uh, to kind of say that you know, we need to bring more pluralist uh, perspectives into economics uh, in university. And then there's Reteaching Economics, where they talk about teaching economics in a different way. I've also been uh, involved in the South Sustainability Research Group, which is somewhat aligned with uh, the kind of research I do. So I'm, I'm looking at the kind of ecological, macroeconomic, ecological space. Uh, and I was involved in that last year with reading groups and continue again to be involved this year. And I've, I've started to organize some stuff uh, myself as part of that. 
Uh, and I guess to contextualize all of this, that was all during a pandemic. So everything was online. I'm sure now that you can actually uh, go into campus, I think there'll be even more uh, interesting things that, that students can, can get involved with. Um, and then I, I guess finally on, on how, like what I'm doing now and what I did after the masters. So I, I, I sort of knew going into the masters that I was interested in looking uh, into, into a PhD and into research. And I, 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 I raised that quite early uh, with the convener of my course. Um, and, and yeah, there, there was a lot of support there, a lot of support in how to, how to write the proposal, how to go through that process, which is really important if you're applying for a PhD because it's a, a little bit opaque from the outside. So, so, so getting that support was, was really useful. Uh, that, that's not to say, and I guess Elise is going to talk to this, not to say that the only thing you can do after a service, uh, service degree is going into research, but I just there, there's definitely support to do that. Uh, and yeah, my experience with the PhD is, is very good, although that's, that's not necessarily relevant uh, to you yet. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's probably all I had to, had to talk on. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass back to Elisa now. Thanks a lot, uh, Adam. And, and just picking up on a few of the issues that um, Adam raises. So of course, this is online, so you cannot see uh, the beautiful campus that we have in the heart of London, but I'm sure that you will have an opportunity to see videos about that. Also, um, our school, the I mean, SOAS, University of London, is quite an intimate college. We're a relatively small, if you want, um, university across uh, where we are situated in, in Bloomsbury. And that means things are quite intimate in terms of uh, we, we get to know our students very well. There is a very strong staff student relationships that uh, develop in particular with our postgraduate students. And then one issue that perhaps wasn't mentioned by Adam, but that always strikes me with our student body, especially at the postgrad level, and that leads me to what I want to talk about next in terms of where will you go after you uh, graduate from SOAS, is that we have a very diverse student body in terms of aspirations. And I think that brings a particular richness to what happens in the classroom and outside of the classroom. What I'm trying to say is that you will be studying with your peers who will have very different ambitions in terms of where they want to take their studies, uh, what they want to do in terms of their career. But that means that in the classroom, you get very lively debates around questioning particular issues from various different angles because people come with a different uh, view on, you know, both on the economy as well as in terms of where do they want to take the knowledge that they're acquiring. So I think that particular diversity in aspirations has a specific richness to the kind of dynamic that we get in the classroom as well as beyond in terms of the cohorts, how they, be, how they come together and uh, how they operate uh, or, or, or act as a, as a community. And I think that year on year we see, even despite COVID, for instance, we had last year a, a postgraduate a student body that had developed a, a strong sense of community. And when we had opportunities to bring them on campus late in May for a set of events, we could see that despite all the uh, physical hurdles that, uh, you know, confinement, lockdown, social distancing, etc., had imposed, there was a sense of community. There was a sense of all of them belonging to that one uh, kind of a species, which is being a Soasian or being an economics uh, Soasian, etc. So I think that's quite, that's quite um, um, nice. Now, of course, if you're going to make decisions on where you're going to go, do, do your degree, you want to know that you are uh, going to be successful in securing, uh, you know, that career path that you are uh, charting for yourself. Now, uh, hand on heart, our postgraduate students go on and do wonderful things. We are each year tremendously amazed by the successful uh, career paths that our postgraduate students uh, embark upon as they leave. Uh, some, of them, some of them will have come to us by way of work, and so they're already on a particular trajectory. But so we have very, very strong uh, employability um, records. As it says here, nearly all of our students will be either in employment or uh, studying, and then a few won't. And if they are, then aren't, then perhaps they are taking up particular caring um, um, responsibilities, etc. Equally for our postgrad research students, I don't know if any of you are here with an interest in our PhD programs, but we, we, we graduate our uh, PhD students to very, very successful uh, and highly skilled uh, employment um, 
What does that mean in terms of our graduates specifically? And I think that to demonstrate those two points, very successful careers, as well as diverse career paths, I thought it's nice to speak to six specific students uh, and the career paths that they have developed uh, as they since they have left us. So if we take, for instance, Bu Sisi, because she was our uh, master's student uh, in 2017-18, she did the program that's convened by Tobias, the Political Economy of Development program, and um, she came to us as a, a Cheminian scholar, and as she uh, left us, she returned to South Africa, and now she's uh, pursuing a very successful career as a researcher at a particular research institute called the Institute of Economic Justice that's located within Witzwaterzand University in South Africa, in Joburg. Now, that's a very different profile from, for instance, Shreya's profile, Pillai. She did the MSc Development Economics with us in 1819, and she was actually seconded to the master's program. So her employer, Price Waterhouse Coopers, paid for her to come and do her master's at SOAS. And so she returned to her job once she had um, successfully completed her master's program. And we've asked her to come and talk to our students um, in the past. And she always picks up on the very strong uh, uh, mixed method skills, both quantitative and qualitative, that she developed while she was uh, at SOAS and how that is giving her an advantage in the kind of work she does as a consultant in the private sector when she's asked to do analytical pieces around a particular development in a particular market, um, et cetera. So someone working in the private financial sector, but who is very strongly benefited benefited from our keen real world engagement, if you want, both quantitatively and qualitatively, um, and how and what that means uh, in practice. Now then, a, a different profile, Guido Maschat, he did his MSc Development Economics in 15, 16, and from there he entered into what was then called the Department for International Development Entry Scheme, now it's the Foreign Commonwealth uh, Development Office. Um, and so he, he, he uh, moved to uh, the country office for uh, Malawi and, and Zimbabwe uh, straight after uh, graduating from us. Then again, a very an, another profile, Arup Chatterjee is a, a, an older graduate from us, did the MSc Development Economics in 910. From there, he went to work for the National Treasury of the South African government, after which he uh, moved to the Southern Center of Inequality Studies in uh, Joburg. Now, Anne Schoenauer, she was a graduate of 19, in 1920. She did the MSc International Finance and Development, and she's the deputy research head of what's an, uh, an NGO that is uh, providing advice in terms of how uh, private financial uh, firms can um, navigate, if you want, the regulatory environments around uh, climate. And then finally, Lorena Lombardozzi, she did both her MSc Political Economy of Development and her PhD in economics with us. And she went on then from there to pursue a successful career in academia, uh, where she currently is uh, recently been promoted to senior lecturer at the Open University. So I think this gives you a sense across different programs, people come for different reasons, but they do end up uh, actually realizing their ambitions um, in terms of whether they wanted to be in the public sector, whether they wanted to be in the private sector, whether they wanted to be in the third sector, or whether they wanted to become uh, academics. The skill set that they gain, and I think also the reputation of our post-grad programs, provides them with strong assets as they pursue those particular career aspirations. We're also, I don't know if any of you uh, are, uh, know what's the ODI Fellowship Scheme. So the ODI is the Overseas Development Institute, is located in London, and they have this scheme that has been running for many decades, where they uh, recruit um, postgraduate um, students uh, and second them onto, into a particular civil service in uh, the Global South. So uh, if you were to be successful when you are selected onto this scheme, you would be possibly stationed in, let's say, the Ministry of Finance in uh, Ghana. Um, so we have had a very strong relationship from within the Swiss Economics Department with this particular scheme. And over the years, we've been quite successful in graduating our students onto uh, the fellowship scheme. And then finally, one other thing I want to mention before I hand over to you for questions is that we have this uh, quite um, in, 
tremendous resource, let me call it like that, which is called SOAS Connect, which is an e-mentoring platform where as a student, you can um, connect onto it. You can indicate which region of the world you have an interest in and what particular sectors you have an interest in. And the, 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 the database, there will, the software will then do a search in the database and try to link you up with the SOAS alumni um, and that, that you then get connected to who can then mentor you uh, over uh, the internet in terms of trying to help you chart that career path that you are uh, pursuing. And I've heard of quite a few successful stories of people who had introductions via SOAS um, Connect, who ultimately landed in the jobs they wanted because they were told to search in this particular way, etc. So I think this is quite a nice resource to keep the community of both students and alumni alive and to tailor that towards uh, career paths uh, for our students. So I think that's all I want to say uh, at this point. I don't know if Tobias or Adam want to add something. Uh, and just also a little heads up, do follow us. We have quite a live Twitter uh, account. Our events get posted on Facebook. Um, and um, I think that's it for me. I don't know, looking at Tobias and Adam, do you want to add something before we open up for questions? Oh, I'm happy to open it up to questions a student have or uh, people interested in studying with us have uh, some opportunities to ask their questions. Okay, I, I see a hand. Please do unmute yourself. I might not be able to see hands because I'm, I actually let me stop sharing so I can see who is here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, uh, for this wonderful and informative session. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very useful uh, for all the prospective applicants. So uh, I have multiple questions. The first one is uh, in QS world rankings, SOAS is ranked uh, highly in developmental studies, uh, particularly. So, and I'm interested in developmental economics. So I wish to know how that academic quality and the, and the prestige of SOAS in development studies percolates or spills over to the development economics course specifically because your website mentions it as, uh, as a flagship course of, of the university. So why, what's so special with it? Okay, shall I, shall I answer that one and then we continue? Is that fine? So thank you very much. Yes, the, uh, the Development Studies Department has a very, very strong uh, ranking in the QS uh, league table. Um, by way of information, quite a few of their staff members are graduates from our economics department, so they have gotten there by way of the SOAS economics department. Um, but beyond that, um, given this whole, um, given the fact that we are very renowned for the heterodox, the pluralist, the fact that we bring together all these different traditions, that does pose a challenge sometimes for economics in terms of being ranked as an economics department because we don't, it, 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 we are not um, necessarily able to access the same kind of say journals in terms of publications, etc. But in terms of the prestige, the scholarship, I can uh, guarantee you that the economics department shares the very strong traditions and within, if you want development economics, it has a very strong brand across uh, the world. It may not be reflected in the economics ranking in the QS um, uh, world uh, rankings, but in terms of if you, if you speak to, when we travel or colleagues travel across the world, the SOAS economics department has that very, very strong uh, if you want recognition of brand in terms of uh, development economics. So I can, I can guarantee you that you, you would benefit very strongly from um, the, this um, advantage that we have in having such a collection of um, development economists uh, as well as ecological economists, et cetera. Oh, thank you, ma'am, that's helpful. I have a few other questions, can I just ask them? Or, yes, or and then we'll turn to, or shall we take first Jeremiah and then we return to you? Would that be fine? Yes. Absolutely not. Sure. Excellent. Maybe Jeremiah. Also just really, really quick to, to, this, to this point. Um, we, in the economics department, given that we do focus a lot on development as well, what, when we submit our papers, we often submit to journals that are not economics-based journals, but rather development studies journals. And that also improves 
the rating for development studies, but um, this does not take away the focus on, on the speciality that we have on development economics. Um, so this is also another little caveat as well. That sounds great. Jeremiah. All right, thank you, my HD. Uh, for me, I think uh, so as stands tall among uh, university all across the world, especially after my encounter with some of the scholars at uh, SOAS in South Africa during the APOD program, African program on rethinking development economics. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I already sent a mail requesting a question about uh, the issue of deferment. But I'm going to add this to it. When a student defer a PhD admission, and uh, within that period, his area of interest changes. What can the candidate do? You have okay. deferred admission a later year, but within the period, your area of interest changed. What can the candidate do? Especially if you are not interested in someone else supervising your work because of change of the area of interest. Okay, thank yeah, you, Jeremiah. Can I perhaps make a specific suggestion to you? Is that you raise this question with our um, doctoral studies admissions tutor, as with Satoshi Miyamura at SM97. So perhaps I'll, I'll type it in the chat um, uh, box, he, his email. So if you raise this with Satoshi and his email is SM97, at soas.ac.uk, he will be able to give you guidance on whether, when you defer your PhD and how you go about changing the topic. I, I don't think there should be a problem in principle. It may need to be that a different supervisor has to be sought within the department, but he will be able to engage you more specifically. So. The, the, the email, as I put it in the chat, is from Satoshi Miyamura, and he's our doctoral student admissions tutor. So he will be able to be much more precise, but in principle, I can't see why there should be objections in terms of changing your topic during the period of, of deferral. So perhaps if All right, we- Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremiah. If we if we return to Chaswan, do you want to follow up with the rest of your questions? Uh, sure, ma'am. So my question uh, pertains to the fact that there are two courses, MSc Economics and MSc Development Economics. So I have seen that uh, by choosing a certain courses, I can in fact cover everything that is taught in developmental economics in the MSc Economics course itself. So uh, how would having MSc Development Economics help, uh, you know, help improve my resume rather than uh, applying for MSc Economics and studying development economic related courses? H am I clear now? Yeah, yeah, no, that's very clear. I don't know, Tobias, if you want to speak to that um, or, or even Adam, who is a student of our MSc Economics, I, you, as you, as you decide which program to choose, you do two separate things. You do what signal do I want to put on my CV and how do I want to populate my program? It's true that our po programs are quite modular in the sense that beyond the set of core, you can, you can puzzle and you can create programs that look quite alike. Okay. Um, so I think the MSc economics will have some compulsory uh, modules that you don't find under the MSc Development Economics. For instance, the Advanced uh, Econometrics module is a compulsory module on MSc Economics, while it isn't on MSc Development Economics. But then beyond that, it's also a matter of, of signal. If you are, um, if you wish, if you already know that you want to be very much signaling the, a direction towards development economics as you leave us as a practitioner, then you may wish to do that kind of degree in terms of the signal it creates on your resume or uh, on your uh, CV. Um, so I think you, you can 
puzzle and the degrees could look quite alike. So it becomes a matter of you then deciding what is it you want to flag. I don't know, Tobias or Adam, if you want to add something to that question. No, I think, I think the signaling is, of course, important. Um, but you also, um, I mean, we are in generally quite a, a small department in terms of uh, the students. So the students know each other relatively well across the different programs. However, um, for example, me as the convener of political economy of development, I try to get the different students together um, at least once a term to discuss something, to just have a social event with them and so on. And that also, of course, attracts a certain kind of student. We, we discuss certain kind of issues that might be then different from, let's say, a convener of development economics that discusses different things with their students. So it, 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 it also feeds into your experience of study, um, not just the modules that you take or the signal that you want to um, want to want to send out to employers, but also how the, how what kind of experience do you have? And I think that is different depending on which program you choose. That helps. Uh, thanks a lot. So I have a I have one more question. Uh, I have currently not decided uh, on doing a PhD, but uh, just so that I have my options open. Uh, what are the students' outcomes? Uh, in getting into PhDs, apart from getting into SOAS, which is a great thing, uh, like in the uh, other top US colleges or the colleges in UK, how are the students' outcomes uh, when it comes to PhD for MSc Development Economics? So is your question in terms of what's your chances of moving from SOAS to another university to do your PhD once you have done the MSc Development Economics? Is, is that your question, Jasmine? Exactly, ma'am. Uh, the uh, prospect of getting into a PhD yeah. course uh, somewhere else also. I mean, I can maybe, Adam, I don't know if you have any uh, feedback on that in terms of from the, the previous year cohort, but I mean, I, I know that those students that do well, so you would have to satisfy the entry requirements of the PhD program wherever you want to go. So often those entry requirements are two on some entry requirements might be passed. So the students that do well will be admitted onto PhD programs across uh, those, I mean, the different universities that offer uh, PhDs in um, development economics. So I, I haven't heard of people that have been frustrated, if you want, in their tra transitioning from our postgraduate programs to anything actually that they want to do leaving us. So that was, I think, the point I was trying to make earlier. Students do actually manage very successfully to uh, realize their aspirations, whether they stay with us to do a PhD, go elsewhere to do a PhD. We support students every year in our master's programs to, as they apply for PhD programs elsewhere, uh, as we act, as ref we provide references, we give feedback on their proposals, et cetera. So I have not heard of instances where people have faced obstacles, but I don't know, Adam, yeah, I, I, I guess I'd sort of echo that. I don't think there's uh, like obstacles in the sense of a, a SOAS degree is, is going to be perfectly acceptable. And obviously a high mark in a, in a SOAS master's degree is going to be something that you will need to be accepted on a PhD. But I think the, the process of getting onto a PhD is kind of far beyond that, right? And it's far more about how the, the research proposal and how you make that. And it's, it's quite an individual thing. So it's not, it's not so much... I, I suppose it's not so much like maybe when you go from a, a, a bachelor's to a master's, it's a lot about just the mark in your bachelor's, whether you get, get, get on a master's and stuff around that. But for a PhD, it's more about what you're able to do individually. But speaking to that, I do think the support for that research proposal and uh, the kind of individual work is very good at SOA. So I, 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 yeah, I guess I'd echo what Lisa said there. Uh, I, I can't think of it, uh, anyone not being enabled to go onto a PhD uh, anywhere from, from SARS. That definitely helps. Uh, thanks a lot for, for very patiently answering all the questions. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Are there any other questions uh, from any of you? I can see we have a few minutes yeah. left. Yes, Jeremiah. Yes, I'm you spoke about, at the introduction, you spoke about the area of uh, grants that, uh, you know, 
research are currently ongoing as so as if a if a PhD student is interested in a particular area, what is the first step to be taken? Do, do you mean with regard to their own PhD or in terms of I'm I'm not sure I, I understand the with, question. Okay. If, if you are a PhD student and you are interested in a particular area that the university has secured grants, mm. what is the first step you are going to do? What is I mean, the first step to be taking? Okay, so so I think of course as a as a student you would be able to reach out to our uh, colleagues and you would be aware and you know once you're here you would get a sense of who are the members of staff what are they working on etc. And then you can easily, as a PhD student, build personal relationships uh, with the particular um, member of staff focused on the area of research that you have an interest in. And from that, different types of uh, professional relations kind of emerge, whether sometimes the, 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 the staff member needs research assistance, maybe they will turn to one of their PhD students, whether they thinking about uh, applying for a different type of grant and there will be opportunities again to write work for a dyspraxic PhD student in it. All these things have happened and all these things are possible, uh, but it, it very much depends on uh, who in the, in, in amongst our colleagues is applying for what type of grant at which point and what does the funding body allow for in terms of incorporating uh, PhD students into it. But it's very, I mean, I think across academia and so also in so as economics, it's a very common practice to try to involve our PhD students as much as we can in our active research community. And that, of course, includes uh, research funded, funded research through grant bodies. But it's a very fluid kind of environment because it also, of course, depends in, on, you know, who's applying for what, which particular theme are they pursuing, whose research fits with that etc so it does happen um, I think um, most of the colleagues in the department will have worked with their PhD students at some point in time uh, either in grant funded research or not um, but we're very keen on that kind of collaborative effort as well as taking up the mentoring role that the you know that 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 entails as a phd supervisor you want to prepare your student for you know the world after and that includes having done publications etc i mean that mentoring is very key yes um I said the mentoring is just very key yeah. yeah i agree with you jeremiah I'm just receiving a message from our SOAS organizers and they are asking me to wrap up as um, the next session will need to start very um, soon. So can I just thank everyone for joining us and thank my colleagues and Adam uh, for um, being here this morning. And then any questions to us, please write to SOAS uh, Economics or and look at the specific look at our web pages and you will find all the details that you will need and adam has just posted his email also in the chat if you want to take up conversations directly with him thank you very much for everyone for joining and hopefully we will see you on our campus in september 2022 thanks everybody and do feel free to reach out as well tf2 i'm also going to write it in the box Excellent. thanks a lot Thanks for clarifying all the questions. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.